previously, we had considered the action of SL2Z on the upper half plane. And we noticed uh, that when we take the quotient of this uh, of the upper half plane by this action, we get an identification between the points of this space and the isomorphism classes of complex elliptic curves. So it became reasonable to be quite interested in this geometry as perhaps it can tell us something about uh, elliptic curves. And if you're following my modular form video series, you know that the space is of quite a, a importance there. Now, one of the issues though, is that in general, if one is to take the quotient of a manifold by some group action, it's not guaranteed you'll get a manifold in return. So if we think about our quotient space or our fundamental domain for this action in any case, uh, one of the things that may cause a, a point of tension is if we think about the stabilizers of each of these points. So most of our points just have stabilizer uh, with two elements, uh, but there's the points I, rho, and negative rho conjugate uh, where we had higher order stabilizer groups. And so it's possible that this may cause singularities on our man manifold. So that's just one example of where things could go wrong. So we're gonna have to do some work uh, in order to check that we get a bona fide manifold here. And recall also, we were hoping to compactify this space by adding a point at infinity. So we're gonna wanna do that in explicit detail as well. So taking things back a moment, uh, let's consider the group SL2C uh, acting on the Riemann sphere. That is the complex upper half plane, union a point at infinity. This is where our considerations all started from. Now, one thing to notice about SL2C is that this is an example of a topological group. So a topological group is not just a topological space with a group action. Uh, whenever you see a something something in mathematics, it normally means that the two somethings, the two structures, they interact with each other in a compatible way. So what that means for a topological group is that with respect to the topology that we give on this group, we want two things to be continuous. First, we want the actual group multiplication to be a continuous map from the product of G with itself into G. And the second thing we want is that the inverse map, that is the map that takes an element and sends it to an inverse, we demand that this should be a continuous map as well. So in the case of SL2C, well, if we think about what's happening uh, in here, these are just, we can view these matrices, A, B, C, D, uh, these are all just subsets of C4. And so we can give this the subspace topology of C4. It's easy then to see that both of the uh, matrix multiplication action and the inversion action, uh, these are continuous maps because ultimately they're just polynomials in the coordinates of C4. And so uh, SL2C is in fact a group action. And so SL2C is in fact a topological group. Uh, furthermore, we looked at uh, the subgroup SL2R, who uh, its action broke into an action on the uh, upper half plane, the real numbers, union a point at infinity, and the lower half plane. And by the exact same argument, but instead this time we can actually restrict this to a subset of R4, we find that SL2R is a topological group. So we're gonna actually focus on this for a moment because it's gonna be useful for us in terms of making sense of the topology and geometry on this quotient space. So one thing that's special about the action of SL2R in each of these cases is that the action is transitive. So what that means is if I have uh, an arbitrary group acting on some set X, we say that the action is transitive if for any pair of elements belonging to X, there exists some element of the group G such that G acting on X produces Y. So in other words, starting at any point of your space X, there exists some matrix, or rather there exists some group element that allows you to get to any other point Y. So my claim is that this holds for SL2R. So 
if we start with an arbitrary element z belonging to the upper half plane and we write it as x plus i y, then I'm going to define a matrix S sub z to be the matrix whose entries are root y, x over root y, 0, and 1 over root y. Because z is in the upper half plane, y is greater than 0, and so taking these square roots, we can be ensured that all of these entries are in fact real numbers. And we can easily read off the determinant of this matrix as well. Uh, it's just going to be the root of y multiplied by 1 over the root of y, which is 1. So this matrix definitely belongs to SL2R. Uh, now, if we look the action of this matrix at the point i, this is equal to writing things out in terms of our uh, Mobius transformation rule. Uh, the root of y multiplied by i plus x over root y divided by 1 divided by root y. So when we carry this out, when we simplify, we're actually going to get multiplication by root y up top. So we'll get root y multiplied by root y in front of the i. So that means y times i plus uh, root y uh, multiplied by 1 over root y. Uh, those cancel out. And so we're left with x plus i y. In other words, we get z back. So we found that for an arbitrary element of the upper half plane, uh, we can uh, construct a matrix that will take i to z. And this tells us that the action must be transitive. Uh, to be a little more precise, if I had z and y in the upper half plane, if I were to first apply s z inverse to z, well, this would take me to i. But then if I apply s sub w, that takes i to w. And therefore, this matrix, S sub Z inverse multiplied by SW, this will take my arbitrary Z to my arbitrary W. We've got this description of a transitive group action. And if you're familiar with things like the orbit stabilizer theorem, uh, we're now going to prove a little lemma that's, well, a, a, a sort of version of that. Uh, in this specific case. So recall that the group uh, SO2R, uh, this is the called, called the special orthogonal group. And this is the collection of all uh, two by two matrices whose values can be expressed as cos theta, minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta, where of course we're gonna let theta run over the entire interval from zero to two pi. And the, the lemma that we're going to prove is that this is equal to the stabilizer uh, of I in SL2R. Okay, so in order to prove this, suppose that we have some element which is in the stabilizer of I. Well, then by definition, I is going to be the same thing as gamma acting on I. And that means uh, writing gamma as A, B, C, D in terms of our Mobius transformation, uh, we get that I is equal to A, I plus B over C, I plus D. So multiplying both sides of this equality by C, I plus D, we find that negative C plus D, I must be equal to A, I plus B. But now gamma belongs to SL2R. So each of its entries are real valued, and therefore we have to equate minus C with B and D with A. In other words, our matrix gamma must look like, uh, must have the form A, B, minus B, A. And because we know that this belongs to SL2R, its determinant is equal to one where the determinant of a b minus b a is equal to a squared plus b squared. But now what we have here is simply the equation for the unit circle. a squared plus b squared equal to one just gives us the unit circle. And we know that each point on the unit circle uh, can be expressed as a equal to cos theta, b equal to sine theta. And thus we have the result. Because our group action is transitive, this means that the stabilizer of every element is just going to be a translated copy of SO2R.
In other words, the stabilizer of every element is isomorphic to SO2R. So that means that each point in the upper half plane can be identified with some copy of SO2R. And these uh, copies of SO2R within SL2R uh, are just a redundancy of the action. So if we were to quotient out by SO2R, we should get a bijection with the upper half plane. So let's make that precise. We're going to define a map from H to the quotient SL2R mod SO2R, where we're going to send uh, a given point Z to its coset uh, S sub Z of SO2R. In order to show that this is a bijection, we'll show that it has a two-sided inverse. And so we're going to define the inverse map by taking an arbitrary coset G of SO2R and sending that to the point G acting on I. So let's make sure that this is in fact a uh, inverse map. So Z is going to be sent to the point Z SO2R. And then if we apply our inverse map, this will be sent to the point S sub Z acting on I. And this is in fact equal to Z. Okay, so we have an inverse on one side. To check the other side, let's see that uh, G SO2R, well, this is going to get sent to the point G uh, acting on I. And in turn, this will get sent, sent to S sub G acting on I of SO2. To R. Well, let's consider the action of S sub G I on the point I. Uh, well, this sends I to G I. So if I were to multiply both sides by G inverse on the left, I get that G inverse S G sub I uh, acting on I is equal to I. In other words, uh, G inverse S sub G I, this belongs to the stabilizer of I. But if that's the case, uh, that's the same thing as saying that S sub G I S O 2 R, uh, the coset is the same as the coset G S O 2 R. So what this means then is that in fact, we find that S sub G I, the uh, coset corresponding to that is in fact the coset that we started with and so we find that we do in fact have a two-sided inverse. Now one thing I just want to point out uh, before we uh, continue with our, our demonstration here uh, because this is going to be useful for the next lemma. Uh, suppose that we started off with the case that these two cosets were equal. Uh, well, then uh, by going, uh, again, by definition, this simply means that G inverse S sub G I is in SO2R, uh, which in turn means that G inverse S sub G I stabilizes I, and then multiplying both sides by G on the left, we get back the original expression. So in other words, S sub G I uh, acting on I is the same as G I if and only if uh, the corresponding cosets are equal. So this will be useful for us uh, in the next part. Uh, but for now, uh, we've demonstrated that we have a bijection of sets. And what's more is this is actually a homeomorphism of topological spaces. Now, I told you what the topology is on SL2R, uh, but you may be concerned about the topology when we take this quotient. So in general, if we have a quotient of a topological space, uh, well, in this particular case, the uh, quotient map is simply the standard quotient map where we send an element to its coset. And we topologize SO2R uh, by demanding that for every open set U of SL2R, the image of U under this projection uh, is in fact open. Uh, so what we want to do is prove that this, uh, both of these maps are continuous, and that will tell us that we actually have a homeomorphism of topological spaces on our hands.
So the first thing we're going to do is actually consider uh, the map from H over to SL2R without the quotient. So we're just sending Z to S sub Z. Notice that uh, S sub Z, if we view this as a subset of R4, and uh, we look at all of these as coordinate entries, well, each of these coordinates is a continuous function of the coordinates of the domain. So here uh, we can view H, uh, well, H is a subset of C, uh, which we can identify with uh, two copies of the real numbers. So here we're looking at Z as uh, broken into a pair, uh, its real part X and its imaginary part Y. So uh, this matrix, uh, the coordinates of these matrices are all continuous functions of those uh, coordinates in the domain. So this map is continuous. And uh, well, by uh, definition, the quotient map is continuous. And so if we simply take the composition of these two maps, uh, we obtain a continuous function. And of course, the composition is this uh, first map that we prescribed here. Okay, so the next thing we need to check is that our second map, uh, the inverse map, is a continuous function. So again, we're going to start off by looking at uh, the map from just SL2R over to H, where of course we're sending G to G applied at I. Again, this is a continuous map. If we look, if we think about what the Mobius transformation looks like, this is going to be defined everywhere and uh, mapping into H. Uh, this is, of course, uh, continuous in terms of the uh, coordinates of the matrix A, B, C, D. So we have a continuous map into H and we want to obtain a continuous map on the quotient space. And so uh, what we're going to do then is simply induce a map uh, from here. So if I call this map F just for short, and suppose I have uh, some cosets that are equal. So I have two possibly different uh, representations for these cosets. Well, this is the case uh, if and only if H inverse G is in SO2R, that is the stabilizer of I. So that means that I is equal to H inverse G acting on I. And that's the case if and only if H at I is equal to G at I. So therefore, uh, if I define a map F tilde, which will take the coset uh, S sub 2 R, uh, this is going to be equal to, uh, I'm going to define it to be equal to G uh, acting on, which is precisely the inverse map we uh, prescribed above. Uh, well, since uh, I'm assuming that these two cosets are equal, uh, I, it must be the case that this is the same thing as H acting on I, uh, but then that is precisely HSO2R. So in fact, I get a well-defined map induced from F uh, on these cosets, and uh, by composition of continuous maps, this induced map must also be continuous. So therefore, I've proved that uh, both the forwards direction map and the inverse direction map are continuous maps, and therefore, as topological spaces, the upper half plane uh, is homeomorphic to SL2R modulo SO2R. Now, this is a really important idea uh, which is gen gets generalized in the broader theory of automorphic forms. Uh, because now what we were looking at before is the space SL2Z uh, quotienting the upper half plane. But now we've seen that we can identify this as SL2Z uh, quotienting SL2R uh, quotienting SO2R. So uh, more generally, uh, in the theory, one typically considers some topological group G. On uh, the right, one considers a compact group. So SO2R, this can really just be identified with the circle, which is a compact uh, topological group. Uh, 
And on the left here, we have a discrete group. So recall that a topological space is discrete if for every point you can find some open set around that point, which does not intersect any other point in the space. And so for SL2Z, uh, this is clearly the case because uh, all its entries are integer coordinates. So one could simply take the standard uh, unit ball uh, around that point with say uh, radius one half and that won't intersect any other integer coordinates. So much later on in my modular form series, uh, we will consider more general cases of a topological group quotiented out by a compact group on the right and some discrete group on the left. Okay, so all of this we've been doing in an effort to try and verify that our space is a manifold. Uh, in particular, uh, this uh, quotient space is a manifold. So in order to do that, uh, there's two things that we need to demand first of the topology. Uh, the first is that the topology is Hausdorff. And the second is that the topology is second countable. What this means uh, for a general topological space, uh, it simply asks that there exists some collection, uh, some countable collection of uh, open sets such that every open set can be written as a union of uh, some sub collection of these open sets. Uh, possibly uh, a finite union, of course, as well. Uh, well, this is uh, quite easily the case. H sits inside of C, which itself uh, on a topological level can be identified with R2. Uh, R2 is second countable, uh, so therefore H is second countable. And then certainly if we were to cut that space down uh, even further, uh, it's going to remain second countable. It's not going to take more open sets uh, by cutting down the space in order to express uh, any open set here. Uh, and well, we can see this uh, in much the same way from the other perspective, if we are to consider SL2R quotiented out by SO2R. So this uh, just inherits second countability, uh, basically from, well, if you want to look at the upper half plane modulo Z, you can think about it as inherited from R2, or in this case, you can think about second countability uh, being inherited from R4. Uh, the other thing we need to show, uh, so the Hausdorff property, recall that this says that for any two points in the topological space, X and Y, I can find an open set about each of these points such that the open sets are disjoint. And so this will be the focus of the next video. We're going to use the tools from this video uh, to prove that the topology on the quotient space is in fact Hausdorff, and that will give us the first step towards prescribing the geometric or manifold structure to this quotient space.